welcome to the December LVIS membership meeting. I'm Patty Farron, co-chair of membership. Rachel Cooper, our Landmarks chairman, is also present. Our program today is a conversation with the new mayor of our wonderful East Hampton Village, Jerry Larson. Many of you probably know Jerry as chief of police for 14 years. Welcome, Mayor Larson. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Rachel. And hello to your membership. I'm very excited. I've been looking forward to this interview for quite a while now. Um, I mean, your organization is probably the oldest organization in the village of East Hampton. I mean, you're older than the village, the incorporated village itself by 25 years. So, um, and you've done so many wonderful things throughout the course of that, you know, 125 years, and you continue to do amazing things for our community. So it's my pleasure, and I'm really honored to be your guest today. Thank you, and it's been a great partnership between the LVIS and the Village for many, many years. And so um, we're thrilled to have you join us today and share with us some of your insights and perspective just in your first uh, couple of months um, here as mayor and sort of what's planned and outline for us some of the things that are um, on the horizon. Well, that's, thanks again. Um, yeah, well, you know, our team got elected and we have the majority of the board. Um, we all share the same vision. And so it's been pretty easy for us to um, hit the ground running. Uh, we started out, I think our first week, we were able to start a uh, farmer's market in the village parking lot. And the reason for that was to bring business, bring people back into the village, which is, um, you know, kind of quiet this time of year. So we started the farmer's market and it's been going every Sunday um, from 10 to three each Sunday. And it's just been getting busier and busier. And people seem to love it. I haven't heard one negative thing about it. It doesn't impact the traffic. It's right behind um, Con Sporting Goods, Gubbins, right in that area back there. And, it, and it's, it has a real street feel. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's all COVID uh, compliant. And, um, you know, we, we enforce the social distancing and, and we really, it really runs very smoothly and people seem to really enjoy it. So uh, I'm there every, every single uh, Sunday, as well as Sandra Melendez and Chris Minardi. And uh, we just want to make sure it's running smooth and people are enjoying it. So that's one of the things we've done right out of the box. Uh, the other thing was we changed the three, the two hour parking to three hour parking. And that was at the request of the business owners because they really felt that people didn't have a long enough time to shop and visit the stores and have lunch. So we were able to do that under an executive order to help business just like we did with the outdoor dining. This is under the COVID um, executive orders to help business. So we're trying to do every little thing to help our businesses survive this um, you know, terrible time that we're, we're in. Um, we also, a lot of things um, uh, that I've noticed that have gone, um, like the, the LVAS comes along, they plant all these beautiful trees. And on Main Street, we have these boxes that surround the trees of, and they're made of railroad ties. And a lot of them are falling apart and it looks really terrible. So we have plans to um, re-surround the trees with granite and do some ground covering instead of the wood chips in the, uh, in those planters, if you will. And I think it'll look, make it look a lot better. There were metal bike racks on the streets that were all rusted and falling apart. We've replaced all those with, um, they're actually, they look like wood, but they're actually recycled plastic. Oh, really? Because I posted an Instagram of the new bike shop, the new bike racks. Right, and they're right. actually recycled plastic. Which was oh! Terrific, and you that can't is. even tell. I mean, you really have to touch it to realize it's not wood, but it just looks so much better. Um, garbage cans, we replaced all the garbage cans that were all mildewed and, and basically disgusting. And we put all new garbage cans out that we had at the highway department. So um, those are just some of the things we've come right out and started doing. And I'm just looking, what I'm looking at is my list. I made a bunch of uh, points that I wanted to make sure I went over. We started fixing the bricks that you'll see in front of London Jewelers and the curbing. Mm -hmm. um, a sidewalk in the back by uh, Fiaro's has been un, unwalkable for over a year. And we just had that reconcreted. Uh, th there's a lot that we've been doing to try to improve our streets. We've been power washing all of the bricks on the street. 
And Dave Collins from the DPW has been very cooperative and very helpful in getting all of this done. Actually, all the members of the DPW have been terrific. Um, it, so it's just, it's just been a lot of work. And, but like I said, we're all on the same page and we've been able to do a lot. We've been having weekly staff meetings with all the department heads. So we're getting everybody on the same page where we want to be. Uh, we're enforcing the COVID rules that the governor has instituted to try to make everybody safe and keep businesses open. We've given the police department those tools they've needed to enforce those rules. So we've been doing a lot. So what, and Rachel has a question. Mm -hmm. No, my comment was just that um, I love the fact that you've been having this um, immediate impact, looking at the things that are incremental that are really improving the quality of life and just visually, you know, from the garbage collection and the other things that we can do to just really um, make this village shine. No, thanks, Rachel. It's just, it's just things that I've noticed over the years that have just, you know, not been taken care of very well. Um, you know, our, one of our big projects on the table is Herrick Park. Yeah. And if you walk through Herrick, Herrick Park, it's really, it's really unfortunate how that park has been left unattended. The tennis courts are unusable. The basketball court is basically unusable. Um, the ball fields were filled with weeds all summer long. It, it's just, it's just not, not, not the way I want the village to look. So we have all those things on our, on our plate to try to, to get those um, back in order. Can you share a little bit more about us, uh, about the plans for the park? Because I know that's been something that's been discussed um, quite a bit. And there have been a couple of different firms that have come in and provided proposals. There was a public forum. Um, can you give us an update on that? Yeah, we're, we're looking at all. We had basically have an architect who gave us his plan uh, for no cost. And then the village, prior to us arriving, paid a company to do a study of the park and come up with a plan. And so we've been looking at both those plans and trying to take the best parts of both and really come up with a plan that everyone's happy with. I know they did a presentation at the middle school and I'd like to, I think we're gonna to wanna to tweak that plan a little bit. And, but you're talking about a project that is somewhere between eight and $10 million. So we are trying to team up with, um, maybe a private public partnership and, and try to secure money and grants that way to pay for this. But we would like to really make an impact, at least get the tennis courts and the basketball courts done by next spring. That's, that's kind of our goal. So at least that would be a good starting point once we decide where we wanna put those in the park. So that's kind of where we are right now. And that sounds like a great first step because as you know, it's not just the public that's using that, but also our middle schoolers using um, those tennis courts for um, the team, team sports and the playground area for um, their gym classes as well. So anything that um, we can do in the short term to improve that would be terrific. Yeah, we actually had a plan for this, sum uh, sorry, for this winter to set up an ice skating rink on top of the tennis courts in the park but it, it fell through because of COVID. We couldn't find anybody who would spend the money and not be assured that they were going to be able to make the money back. You know, because if they could spend all this money to install this ice rink and then not be able to operate it. So we really, unfortunately, we had to put that to the side for now. Mm -hmm. and, but that is a plan moving forward, at least in the winter months. Similar to what Buckskill um, does, I'm sure everybody's been to Buckskill where they, they take an ice rink and they put it over the top of the tennis courts. And we could do a very similar thing in our park and, and we could keep it open and have family skating. We're not looking to do hockey, but we are looking to do family skating. And, and the whole concept here is to bring people into the village that will then you know, use our restaurants and our stores and, and bring the village back to being more lively. And that's what we campaign for. And that's what we're really focused on. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the additional parcel that's in the back of the park? Um, was that purchased by the village? And is there a specific plan in place for that? Yes, there, there is a parcel in the back that's already been purchased um, by using CPF money. And CPF money is the Community Preservation Fund. 
and there's a tax when people transfer their properties, there's a 2% tax, and then that money is collected by the townships, and then we apply to the town for properties that we want to purchase, either for open space or for passive um, recreation. And that piece of property in the back has already been purchased. And um, there, are, there are plans from the original Nelson Pope, I believe it is, who drew up the plans for the park to incorporate that into the park. So again, I'm not sure if that is such a great idea at this point. And the only reason I'm saying, I mean, the property is there. And I just think that we, we don't do a very good job of maintaining what we have right now. <laughs> and I think we would be smarter to maintain what we have before expanding into new, new areas that we may not have the money or the funding to take care of. I mean, I've seen this with other things in the village. We have uh, the Historical Society House on Main Street, 101 Main Street, and it's in desperate need of a repair. Somewhere probably in the neighborhood of, you know, between three and $500,000 worth of repairs. There hasn't been much upkeep of the property over the last 20 years. So a good example of that is like we have that historic house that was donated to the village and we haven't been maintaining it. And now we went out and we're starting another museum, the Dominie Museum on North Main Street, which is a, a beautiful project. But again, we're, we're taking money to finish that project, but we're not even maintaining what we have. So I think we should just take, the property is ours, we should just take a little slower time to see what exactly we want to do with the property. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what about the workforce housing, uh, Jerry, that you've been mentioning? Yeah, so the, the workforce housing project um, and a mom and pop store project is kind of goes hand in hand. And I was talking about doing that on Railroad Avenue, which is the old, uh, Ben Kropinski owns the property now. Um, prior to that, it was Frank B. Smith Lumberyard. It's right behind the Villa Italian store. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bunch of acres back there. It's kind of um, in disarray, I guess you could say right now. But if, my plan would be if the village was to purchase that or a public-private um, partnership, we purchase that property and then we build, you know, a three-story building that would house mom and pop stores on the first store, on the first floor, all rent controlled, and then workforce housing on the second and third floor. I think it's... Um, it's an area that we could do it in. It wouldn't create too much density because we have plenty of open space over there. So I think it's a project that we should be looking for. I'm not sure if it'll happen, you know, sooner than later, but um, it's something that we should definitely be looking, looking for. And I know there is some interest in that. I've already had, since I've been talking about this, I've already had inquiries from private organizations that are looking to get involved with this. So I think that would be a good area to improve. And then it, it also, it, it kind of links right into the parking lot and to Herrick Park. So it, it's kind of a perfect way to expand the village into um, another area. And then, you, go ahead, Rachel. No, I was just gonna ask when you mentioned um, kind of as the connection point between the two, areas of the village, we have the parking project that's also going on right now, which I know is a big focus. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? We've heard about um, some diagonal parking coming back and then also some paid parking um, that's going to be coming to our, um, to our lots behind that's the right. hotel lane. So all of this kind of works hand in hand. So the, the idea of the paid parking was an idea I've had for a very long time. And what it would do is we would allow the two hour parking as it is in the parking lots and one hour on the street. But if you wanted to stay longer, you would have an option of paying and it's all an app based system. So it's on your smartphone and you don't have to do anything if you're only staying for two hours. But if you are find yourself in a restaurant or running late, you could then um, use the app to extend your your stay by paying a fee. And we would earmark that money to be used to pay for our septic system, which we desperately need. 
in the village. Right now, um, all the septic systems in the village of East Hampton in the business district are in the um, watershed area for the Hook Pond. Mm -hmm. So what happens is everything on the surface and everything below the ground eventually makes its way into Hook Pond. So a lot of these septic systems are basic old cesspools that are in the ground that all these businesses are using. So the, the concept here is to put a centralized sewer system in that would capture all of this and then you wouldn't have all of that nitrogen going into our into our hook pond. So the money raised from the parking would go to pay for this centralized sewer system, which would go a long way in helping us with the water quality of hook pond. So that's kind of the, the concept. And the reason for the diagonal parking, one, it gives us more parking than parallel parking. Two, it's easier for people who are not that experienced drivers to diagonal park, because I don't know if, <laughs> parallel parking is very difficult for even a good driver, um, especially in the summer when people are right on your bumper, it's almost impossible to parallel park. So, and then the, the third reason is to allow more outdoor dining. So with parallel parking, as you probably noticed, we had to take the parking spots in front of say Cheetah and Sam's and Golden Pear because if you parallel park, your, your car door is kind of open right into people's tables, which is not really a very, you know, nice way to dine. So by turning the cars diagonally, you're not having car doors open into the, into the tables and it will allow for more outdoor dining. I know last summer, Fiero's um, Pizza Restaurant would, let, would have liked to have a table on Newtown Lane and they were denied because they would have to shut down more parking. The last thing we wanna do is shut down parking, in my opinion. So by going diagonal, we don't have to shut the parking down and we can still maintain outdoor dining. It gives us more parking spots. Um, I have revised my plan though, since um, my campaign, we are not going to do diagonal from Pleasant Lane to Park Place. It's only gonna be from, basically from Stop and Shop or 66 Newtown, which is across from Stop and Shop to the traffic light at Main and Newtown. Uh, and the reason that I've changed my plan is because I met with Wittendales and they brought up a very valid point that diagonal parking is not conducive for their business because most people who buy things are putting them in their trunks of their mm -hmm. cars mm. or the back of their SUV, and which means they would be out in the street. So parking is not that important at that end of the street for me because we don't really have any uh, dining going on up there or anything like that. So we revised the plan, which Drew Bennett has already drawn up and will be presenting soon to the public uh, from 66 Newtown to the traffic light. Mm, I know that's a lot. Is, is that on both sides of the street? Yes, both sides of the street. Oh, great. So how many more cars will we be able to accommodate? Well, in that little area, it's not going to be made many. I think it was like 10 or 15 more. Oh. And, you know, unfortunately, but it, it's still conducive for, it's easier parking, in my opinion. I also think it would, it takes congestion out of your parking lot, because if you can't parallel park, you're not even looking for a parking spot on Main or Newtown, you're going into one of the parking lots so you can uh, park more comfortably. So by making it diagonal, I think you could alleviate people going in and searching for parking that they're able to negotiate. So uh, I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a smart plan. And you know what I like about um, the village? It's a small municipality. If we try it and it doesn't work, we can always change and go back to what we were doing. It doesn't mean we're stuck in this forever. It's just paint on the ground. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really simple to, um, to change, change courses if something's not working. But I think it's worth trying. Definitely. Okay, so shall we go into the Q&A from our members? Sure, whatever you, whatever you want. Do you have, do you have one okay. more? Bob? I've got a do few more have... things I can tell you about. Okay. Um, <laughs> we purchased, um, recently we purchased a new street cleaner because the one we had was not really cleaning the streets. It was putting more dirt on the street than taking off. So we were able to immediately um, lease to buy one of these units. And uh, you'll see it out there on the street now. It's, it's fantastic. It takes the weeds out off the curb lines, takes the weeds off the top of the sidewalk. It's, uh, it has power washes on both sides of the back of the unit. It's just incredible that it really lets DPW do a great job. Um, 
you know, we campaigned about getting things done and, and about being friendlier. And that's really what this is all about. We, we, we kind of structured our, um, our appointed boards. And what I feel is we, we put people in place that have the same vision as, as we do and that are going to be friendlier and will come up with great ideas to move our village forward. So we, we really have a lot going on. We've only been in office for 60 days, so we've done mm -hmm. a lot. But if you want to start with the questions, and if I think of anything else, I'll certainly okay. bring okay. it up. So the first question is from Darrell Godfrey, who was a fabulous local photographer for the Star. And her question is about banning gas-filled balloons for sale in the East Hampton Village, because as we all know, they're on the beaches, they're in our ponds, and um, we're just hoping that maybe you could uh, investigate that. Yeah, I know that's been um, on the table for a while, and we definitely have to look into it, but I, I just, I, I can't speak of it. I don't know enough about it. I know the balloons are bad, and I know the village put in a, um, a prohibition to intentionally releasing the balloons. Um, I know we have several stores in, in our village that sell them. I don't know if banning them from selling them and then people just go to another business just outside the village is really going to help the problem. So, but it's something we should, we should look into and we have to investigate, I agree. And we're not, you know, we're not opposed to it, but I wanna let Darrell know we, we have been listening to her and we have removed the signs at the beachheads and moved them off to one side of the beach so that you're, when you're parked at the beach, you're not blocked by a big sign. <laughs> we call it the <laughs> sign of no, that <laughs> tells you everything you're not allowed to do. So we've moved those to the side. So when you're parked in your car and you're trying to look at the ocean, you can actually see it now. Mm -hmm. So those are really, to her. yeah, yeah, I know. She's a, she's a star. Okay, Pam and John Cataletto have quite a few questions. And their first one was, um, increase safety about the three crosswalks on Main Street because they're very dangerous. I'll start with that. So the, um, we have the only Main Street on the eastern, eastern end of Long Island that has four lanes. So I know that the previous mayor, Rickenback, had talked about reducing those lanes to one lane in each direction, which would be similar to every other Main Street that we have. That would go a long way in helping prevent accidents at the crosswalks. The problem with the crosswalks, and I've seen it, I was chief for 14 years, I was the police department for 34 years. The two lanes, one car stops and the other car doesn't realize what's going on and they're passing. And then the people in the crosswalk only see the one car stopped and it's, it's super dangerous. And people have been hit, people have been seriously injured. And jumping back to uh, Newtown Lane, by joining with the diagonal parking, we're gonna eliminate that double lane. So right away, Newtown will be safer. And I think that would be a good trial uh, pilot program, if you will, to see how that works. And then maybe that's something we wanna do on, on Main Street. I don't know. Um, speeding, we do have police out there enforcing the speeding, the speed limit on Main Street. If we wanted to lower the speed limit on Main Street, we would have to ask the state permission because it's a state highway. Um, okay. But I think the police department does a good job out there as far as um, enforcement. Yeah. And then will the town pond be dredged? Yes, the town pond is scheduled to be dredged. It was supposed to start in October. It was delayed because of some DEC um, requirements or holdups or tests. Um, we just got clearance, I think last Friday, to go forward with the project. So we are, um, we have green light to do it. And we've told the contractor he's um, ready to go. So we are going to start it. The great news, not only, the great news of dredging the pond because it definitely needs it. But the really good news is Marcos Belladron, who's my new village administrator. Um, we had a grant for $191,000 towards the $868,000 it's going to cost. But we may have secured grants and... Um, um, funding to cover the entire project. So that would not come out of taxpayer money. So we're really excited about that. We just found that out the other day. Okay. He did. So um, that's exciting news. But I can't wait when that pond is dredged and it, 
and it looks great again. <laughs> Hate to use that term, um, but it's just going to look it's going to look fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's and the entry to the. You know what I learned about the LVIS? Did you know that in 1895 the LVIS saved the pond from being filled in? No, it's on your website. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They were going to fill it in. And the LBIS stepped up and stopped it from happening. Good. Well, we're still continuing here. You are. And so what are the projects that the village has under construction? Are they in the budget this year? Yeah, everything we're doing. We, we have a big um, brick project being done in front of London Jewelers. That's all being done in-house. That's all being done by DPW. And that's all, um, there was really nothing to budget. It's just manpower hours. Okay. And, and the bricks we already had. So that's okay. um, the sidewalk money. That's all budgeted. Everything we're doing has been, has been budgeted. Okay, great. And Aisha Kenmore wants to know, what changes are you making to the philosophy or the code of the Village Zoning Board of Appeals? So we have a zoning and planning committee set up. And that, that committee is made up of residents. It's made up of the head, the chairperson of each of our appointed boards. And, and it's um, chaired by Deputy Mayor Chris Minardi. And they will go through the code and they will make recommendations to the village board on what they decide needs to be changed in the code. So as of right now, again, we've only been here two months. They're, they've met once. And I know they have some legislation um, coming our way that they're gonna recommend that we change. Okay. And what do you envision with the rules of Airbnb and for social events within the local ends? Well, let's start with the, uh, I hate to single out Airbnb, but we'll, call it, we'll just call it short-term rentals. Okay. So we have put a committee together uh, starting in January, people who are in support of short-term rentals and people who are opposed to them. And we're gonna come up with a plan legislation that we can uh, codify into our code and, um, enforce what, whatever legislation we come up with. The, um, the building department that we have now uh, is made up of three, uh, three people. Mm -hmm. We are moving that building department to 88 Osborne Lane after the first of the year. And we are hiring an, an additional building inspector who will work out of that building. So basically our building department would be one-stop shopping at 88 Newtown, which will free up a lot of congestion at Village Hall. Okay. And uh, the fire marshal will then go back to the firehouse, okay. which is Kenny Cullen. Okay. Kenny Cullen and is then going to work on um, finding these short-term rental violations and enforcing whatever um, law we come up with on that. Yeah. And... Um does that mean the meetings come to an end when I hear that little, I don't know. Anyway, do we have time for one more question? The East Hampton uh, Village is very important to our community. This is from Janet Dayton. And as we move forward with today's plannings, what are your thoughts on supporting and enhancing our village's treasured past? Yeah, so the, I have a, I have a um, the history is very important to me, obviously. And if anybody knows me, they'll know I'm a history buff. Um, I've actually come up with a plan to honor all of the past 11 mayors. We're gonna honorarily name the street that they lived on while they presided as mayor um, as in their name. So we're gonna start in January with honoring um, Paul Rickenback, who was our mayor for, I don't wanna be quoted on this, but 28 years, something like that. So we're gonna take Maidstone Avenue and we're gonna make it uh, the, the honorable Paul F. Rickenback Jr. Um, dedicated road with his um, uh, years of service on the sign. It'll be a different color than the street sign. You've probably seen them. They, they do it in other communities where they'll, they'll um, you know, dedicate a street to somebody who's done something terrific for their, for their community. So that's one way we want to honor, honor people. I also would like to see uh, more tours uh, given not only by the historical society, but maybe by the village. Uh, Hugh King does a great lantern tour, which is fabulous. I'd like to see that going every weekend. Don't tell him, but I would like to see that going. Um, yeah, there's, there, I think there's a lot we can do. I had something else that 
was just thinking, of, I can't remember what it was, but um, history is very important to me and, and I want to keep the history. And I said all during my campaigning, we can, we can have the history and we can still have 21st century amenities. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So history is important. We're not going to forget our history and we're going to, you know, honor our history. I know what it was, Patty. So one of the other things that we're looking into doing um, to enhance our history or to expose our history, to get more people involved in the history of the village is to take our work sessions on the road to our historic locations, such as Guild Hall, the Clinton Academy, um, 1770 House, the, the Maidstone Inn, the library, Oddfellows Hall, which was another important part of our history, uh, Guild Hall, and, and have our work sessions broadcast from there. Have you, King, tell us the history of the building? And maybe if it's an inn, you have the innkeeper tell us about the inn. And it, it, would, it would expose more people to the history of our village, which I think would go a long way in, um, in keeping our history alive. I'm sure the LVIS would like to be on your list too. Yes, LVIS. <laughs> okay. Oh, another another okay. thing we did, going, keeping in, um, you know, campaigning, we, we were telling, we wanted to be more friendly. The village has this bad reputation of being the village of no, and we wanted to make it all a family. And Thanksgiving was a great example of what I'm talking about. The fire department, the police department, the ambulance, um, all got together and, and gave money to um, um, basically Sandra Melendez spearheaded an effort to help the food pantries. Oh, okay. And Sandra and my wife um, were able to um, get a group of people, including the Hedges Inn, uh, Jenny Lilja, who runs the Hedges Inn, let us use her kitchen. She was actually the, the person doing most of the cooking and they made over made 500 pies for the, uh, wow. for the food pantries and they were delivered. So, you know, that's my feeling of, of a village and friendly government. We want to help business. We want to help residents. We want to be friendly to our tourists. And we certainly want to help in any way we can with the community. When we were, run, when we were campaigning and running, we raised 113,000 for the food pantries when we were put on pause from the election. So this, these are the things that we want to do. And that's why the farmer's market is important to us. And um, just being a friendlier, uh, more coherent government. Great. Okay, well, well we better uh, close and say the LVS would like to thank the LTV and their team of Jason Nauer and Morgan Duke Vaughn for taping our meeting. And many thanks to Mayor Larson for his insights into our amazing village and have a safe and happy holidays all. And thank you very much and happy holidays to your membership. And I look forward to working with all of you.